Toronto has beaten Miami and New York in a new study. It's not good, though. It's uh, published this week comparing housing affordability, surprise, surprise, in 28 American cities and 12 Canadian cities. And Canada is generally less affordable with some notable exceptions. Okay, so here are the top 10 least affordable cities in the report in order. San Francisco at number one, San Diego, Vancouver, Los Angeles, Boston, then Toronto, followed by Miami, New York, Seattle and Hamilton, Hamilton, Burlington. Um, look, it's uh, th- that shouldn't surprise you. I'm actually surprised Toronto's not higher on the list, to be honest. Uh, Vancouver is at uh, number three. Look, San Francisco has always been expensive. San Diego is the size of a postage stamp. If you've ever um, flown into San Diego, like you're right there. It's tiny. Uh, Vancouver is Vancouver. So I'm surprised that Boston is ahead of Toronto. But there you go. Um, It also I think I think part of it has to uh, has to do with the fact that um, we as Canadians are watching our the value of our paycheck go down and what we can do with it, the power of our paycheck. So it's just harder to pay for what we already have. So even if the prices didn't go up, the fact that the, what we can do with our paycheck is going down makes the, the dream of home ownership all the less attainable. Anyway, I could talk about this with, <laughs> with no knowledge base for an hour, but instead let's bring in somebody who actually knows her stuff. Devel Morrison with Bosley Real Estate Limited. Good morning to you, Devel. Good morning. How are you doing, Ben? I am well. Um, look, I'm, I'm in the housing market. I got my house. I'm doing my best to keep up with my payments. Uh, But, you know, the goal was to get in young so that I could climb that uh, climb that ladder. And I I think I'm where I want to be. But what did you think of what I said? Because the the power of our paycheck is going down that no matter what uh, we do on the on the sidelines, it's uh, it's just it's, it's an uphill battle. Absolutely. It's a reality with inflation and the amount of price and the amount of money we have to spend just on groceries alone, never mind, yeah. you know, finding a place to live. I mean, yes, it's interesting to see that, uh, you know, we are more expensive than some of those big American cities. But then I think at least we've got our health care. We don't have the guns problems that they do in the U.S. So while I can understand people are upset that our city is so expensive, I also think that we do have to look on the bright side. All right. Well, let's look at something that could help um, the new cutting red tape to build more housing act. That's a mouthful. Uh, but here in Ontario, that could include a reduction in the amount of parking devel- parking developers need to, to build and special rules that would fast track the construction of student accommodations and a use it or lose it policy. I want to focus on that aspect of this act. What is a use it or lose it policy? Well, so essentially what they're saying is that after the developer has their approvals in place, they have two years to build. Now, I think that that having that policy is a little bit misguided because you haven't taken into the fact that there's a lot of factors that can make uh, that that either assist or do not assist that developer in starting construction. So number one would be construction costs. Can they actually find the labor to do the job? Yeah. Number two would be financing. How expensive is that? Is it going to be to finance that construction? And we all know from last year and still currently, even this year, interest rates are so high that it's affecting the development community. Some of them can't start construction because it's too expensive. They still have to sell at least 70 to 80 percent of the units before they can even get the construction, excuse me, construction financing their money released so that they can even start building. So to have a two year use it or lose it basically tells me they don't understand how the development community actually works. Yeah, it it, it seems to me that that you need incentives to do something like this. Like you can either have a carrot or a stick. And to me, this is neither. This is almost like this is this is putting them in a box. So you got a carrot, a stick in a box and limiting Mm -hmm. limiting what they can do with it is not the incentive that they need to get it done. And the reality is, is that, of course, the developer wants to start building as quickly as possible because all of the money, the the deposit money that people have given up is all sitting in trust. They don't get it until it's completed. So, of course, they want to build, complete and close as soon as they possibly can. They don't need the government to come up with some silly use it or lose it provision to do that. And what about the, uh, the provisions in it for student housing? You know, I haven't looked into the student housing as much. Um, I looked into the parking, which I thought. Well, tell me about the parking. 
Yeah. So with the parking, I mean, it is really expensive to build parking spaces and to build underground parking, and it does add a lot of cost. So I do think that fewer parking spaces is very interesting, and that is certainly good. That will actually help people have lower maintenance fees mm. going forward. So I do think that that's a, a really good idea. You know, one of the things that you know is is a big concern is the development charges. And so one of the changes that they made was they said that municipalities could increase development charges at a faster rate. Increase which, them. Increase them at a faster rate. Okay. Which I think it's a big mistake. Yeah. So let's look at a condo that costs about six hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. There are so many development fees, park levies, education levies, yada yada yada, charges, taxes, that if you got rid of all of those things, that $600,000 condo would be $450,000. My goodness. Like that's, and so yeah. Is not is a $450,000 condo a lot more affordable than a $600,000 <laughs> condo? Look, and uh, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I was, I was driving in today listening to this very radio station. I heard about the announcement that the feds made on housing, another billion dollar announcement in the lead up to their budget. And, and they said they were going back to a policy that worked in the 60s and 70s to build a lot of apartments. So I'm not I'm unclear on the details on it, but it reminded me, why don't we look at how many fees and uh, were, were on condos and, and apartments in the 60s and 70s? My sense is there were far fewer. <laughs> and and it doesn't make those any less safe and it doesn't make, but it seems like they have been adding red tape and, and, and barriers and additional costs um, time and time again without reviewing. Do we even need them anymore? Absolutely. And one of the other, you know, announcements that the federal government made was about this 30 year amortization for first time home buyers. Yeah. Right. So the challenge with that is it's only for new construction. They felt that they didn't want to ramp up the current market, get prices too high by allowing those first buyers into the existing market. But here's a couple of flaws with that 30-year amortization. Number one, we know that you're going to be paying more interest at the beginning of that mortgage. Yeah. So less money is going to be going towards equity. You've restricted first-time buyers into for new construction. If you buy a pre-construction house, you put a deposit down, your money is not protected. No. If you buy a pre-construction condo, your money is protected, which is great, but you need to also see over the last little while, we've had a couple of developers go bankrupt. And so you've got a couple of times where buyers have their money sort of in this in this free fall position. And if you were to compare buying a resale condo, the price per square foot on the resale condo is around $1,000 to $1,200 per square foot. The price per square foot on a pre-construction condo, now you're looking at maybe $1,500 to $1,800 per square foot. So you're basically putting first-time buyers into a questionable part of the market by allowing this 30-year amortization. I'm not sure you're really helping them out. No, I think, listen, with all the announcements, it just seems like more and more announcements are being announced on top of each other. It doesn't feel like they are harmonized. It doesn't feel like they're, everyone's rowing in the same direction. And to use a, a you know, a construction uh, image, like maybe it's time to take the entire housing market concept down to the studs and build up again start start from scratch because this thing this thing feels broken but look a long time before the next election so we got a lot to talk about until then i hope you have a wonderful weekend Devel, and we'll talk to you soon perfect all right thanks again